Good morning. We are doing a hospitality class on Sunday mornings at Courtyard, and it came to our attention that people wanted to view it. They wanted to see it in video for people who uh, join us virtually or who were out or just to watch it again to pick up on points that they missed during class. But we did not record the first class, the introduction class. So this is the intro. I will put the slides for the intro in the comments below. It will help if you follow along the PowerPoint presentation, the slides as we go along, and I'll tell you when the slides change in this video so that you can follow along. But the class is on hospitality. So we open by asking, what is hospitality? What does that mean to you? What images does it conjure up in your mind? Do you think about the Eucharist? the bread and the wine? Do you think about welcoming refugees off of a boat into a new country? Does hospitality make you think of the housewife who's preparing meals for a dinner party in her home? Does hospitality bring biblical stories to mind? Maybe the Genesis 18 or Genesis 19 narrative about Abraham and Sarah welcoming in the strangers. Or hospitality makes you think of hospitals or hotels or, um, you know, the, these modern concepts of what comes up on your Google images when you type in hospitality or support groups. There's an image there in the PowerPoint slides of a PTSD soldier support group receiving each other's stories and burdens and um, working through struggles and trials together. Is that what you think of when you think of hospitality? Whatever comes to mind most prominently might evolve or fall out of favor completely or change in order to something else that you think of when you think of hospitality as this course goes on. Uh, but in truth, all of those images that you see on that first slide do represent hospitality. But we want to redefine, or maybe define for the first time, what we mean by biblical hospitality. So which might be a little bit different than just regular hospitality. So let's work through that. First of all, let's consider what happened to hospitality. Where did it go? What? Because hospitality is a very strong virtue of the church in the Old and the New Testament. It's a virtue of prominence, just like love, faith, grace, all these other virtues. But as time went on, it's a virtue that really fell out of favor in the church. It wasn't practiced as much. So why? What happened to biblical hospitality? Well, in the Bible, this is going to slide number two, you see some uh, graphics there. In the Old and New Testament, hospitality takes place in threshold spaces. We'll talk about what that means later. Or in homes. But then as time moves on, you get into the fourth century and hospitals are invented. There's that, that first hospital from the word hospitality. And that is where people are cared for. You move into the fifth century with the desert mothers and fathers and um, as monasteries develop. And that is where criminals actually flee for safe haven, where sick people go for care, where the true strangers in society society go as guests and their needs are met. Hospitality is moving from the home into more organized stations until you get into the Middle East, uh, not the Middle East, but the Middle Ages rather. And hospitality, when it happens in a home, it's done as a status symbol. I have money and I'm going to show it off and I'm going to do a fancy dinner and it's going to show my status in society. Then you move into the Reformation and the Protestant church, um, maybe not intentionally, certainly not maliciously, but pendulum swung as the pendulum swings in church history in all sorts of ways. Pendulum swung against hospitality because it was something that the Catholic church did. It's what was happening in monasteries and through uh, the sanctuary of the Catholic Church. Remember the red door of a church that says, this is a safe haven. You are welcome here, like the hunchback of Notre Dame, where the red door is found on the Catholic Church. That is a place of sanctuary, which is a form of hospitality. 
So as the reformers were bucking up against all things Catholic, um, hospitality fell through the cracks. It was, was lost as well. Continually going through time, we land in our modern era where hospitality in the home is practically non-existent because here we are now in subdivisions and I'm in a home like that I'm here in my work office or my home office today I live in one of these big box houses in a subdivision if you drive through your neighborhood through most any subdivision or neighborhood in America today at 2 30 or 11 30 on a Tuesday most of those houses are empty they stand empty. There's no one home to offer hospitality. It's a lot of space that's here, but nobody's in it during the day. And in the afternoons, if someone is in it, um, someone said in class when we talked about this, I said, who's in the house at three o'clock on a Tuesday? And they said, the dog, <laughs> which is true, or the children. There's no one there to offer hospitality. If you've been overseas into the least developed world, you've seen the counter to this in the Middle East or in Africa, some parts of Southeast Asia, where communities are still in a circle. Extended family units are there, maybe in, um, in huts or small homes around each other with a courtyard in the middle. And they are then available to offer hospitality to anyone who comes in because there's somebody there to do it during the day, but that's not the world we live in in most of America. Often, that is why you find truer biblical hospitality among the poor than you do in the middle or upper classes of America. It's a, it's a really sad phenomenon, quite honestly. So the future, how do we um, restore biblical hospitality to the church here in America? How do we make it something that works again when our culture and our lifestyle, our structures and our systems are really stacked against it. We have handed hospitality over to the government, to, um, to, to, to systems like uh, you know, housing projects, HUD housing, food stamps, Medicaid, Medicare. If people have a need, it can be met in the government system many, many times. And a lot of those people fall through the cracks too, and we're going to talk about them later. But, um, and I'm not even saying that that's a bad thing. The government and, and civic authorities picked up the dropped plate of hospitality around the time of the Reformation, post-Reformation, with the best of intentions, and it was good. And these systems and structures have been, um, with great compassion, honed and nurtured as time has gone on. But what that's done is it's left the church off the hook. There hasn't been the pressure on the church to offer hospitality because somebody else is going to do it. And again, that's why you see biblical hospitality still thriving in the least developed world because they remained on the hook for it. It remained a life or death matter to them. And more and more so today in our world, it's becoming a life or death matter again. So the church needs to learn this lesson quick. So let's see what we can do. Moving to the next slide here. In the slideshow, you see a table and chairs and the Greek word philoxenia. You don't find the word hospitality in Hebrew in the Old Testament, but you do find the Greek word for what we translate anyway as hospitality, philoxenia in the New Testament. This is what Paul says. He doesn't say hospitality, he says, Philoxenia, which we translate as hospitality, but what does that word really mean? I think it's it's lost something as time has gone on. Philo and xenia. Those of you who remember high school English class, you have two Greek roots. Philo, love or like. Friendship is affiliated with that, but but love there. Bibliophile is a book lover, yeah. So philo and then xenia, stranger. You might be more familiar with the word uh, xenophobia, to be afraid of a stranger, to despise a stranger, philoxenia, to love the stranger, to love 
the stranger. That's what Paul's talking about in the New Testament, to love the stranger. So I encourage you, as you go forward here in the class, whenever you would use the word hospitality, swap it out for the phrase, love the stranger. We need to open our home to offer hospitality. We need to open up our home to offer love to the stranger. We need to perfect our hospitality. We need to protect our love for the stranger. And I think that really draws that line of contrast between what we see in hotels today, what's going on at, you know, the Hilton, versus what's to be going on in the church, loving the stranger. And it also points to something more internal, doesn't it? Love the stranger. Philozenia, that's what we've been translating as hospitality. And that begs the question posed on the next slide, who then is the stranger? Who am I supposed to love? It's like the guy uh, asking Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes on and tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Who is the stranger? Well, an excellent book to get on hospitality, there's quite a few, and I will... Um, show you a slide of those here at the end, but one is Henry Nouwen's, Henri Nouwen's uh, Reaching Out, classic, excellent uh, work there. And in Reaching Out, Nouwen covers so much of hospitality, but one quote that he has, he says, in our world of strangers, estranged from their own past, culture, and country, estranged from their neighbors, friends, and family, estranged from their deepest self and their God, we witness a painful search for a hospitable place where life can be lived without fear and where community can be found. So we find the stranger in one who has been estranged, one who has been cut off from some life support system, whether it be their own past or their family or friends or especially faith community, meaningful, deep community, people who have been um, estranged from themselves or from God, these are by definition strangers, people who have become estranged from a life support system. And there was someone in our class who then pointed out, well, then everyone's a stranger right? Because we've all been estranged from something. And yes, there is some deep truth in that. We are all strangers in some way. That should illuminate for us this level playing field in our strangeness. But as we go through this class on hospitality, I don't want us to, oh, I don't, I don't know, just, just get um, so comfortable with us all being strangers that it loses its concreteness. They would say, well, if everybody's a stranger anyway, and if I'm a stranger, then, you know, anything I do is hospitality and it doesn't really matter. We don't want to go that far down the road. We don't want to lose sight of the people who are truly strangers. One who is a stranger, yeah, it could be yourself. It could be someone who lives under your roof. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a child or an extended family member, but it's also those people who Dr. Christine Pohl, uh, and, and she is one who illuminated, who really brought back into focus this concept of hospitality in our modern world through her works um, about community. She has several books on hospitality, Dr. Pohl. But she talks about people without a place. And she defines those people as those who are detached from life-supporting systems like family, work, polity, and religious community. So who are these people? Maybe jot them down. Who are the people who are truly without a place? These would be people like who? Immigrants, refugees, orphans, widows without a source of income, homeless people, the extremely poor, um, as someone mentioned in class, the elderly, especially the elderly who don't have a lot of social security behind them and they get put into uh, really subpar uh, late-term life 
facility centers. These are people who are truly estranged from all life support systems and they need to have our greatest attention. We cannot lose sight of them. We can't say, oh, well, yeah, th there's those people, but, you know, they're strangers within my own roof, so I'm just going to focus on them and ignore the people who are truly without a place. We don't want to do that. We don't want to lose sight of them. Keep our eyes on all of those who are strangers, who could be people without a place. Why don't we? Why don't we love them? Why don't we practice phylloxenia? What gets in the way? Answer that question in your mind right now. Why do you not practice biblical hospitality? Why don't we love the stranger? You're probably thinking of things like pride, selfishness, risk, boundaries, and all of those things will be discussed as this class goes on. But here's another quote from now on. This movement from hostility to hospitality is hard and full of difficulties. Our society seems to be increasingly full of fearful, defensive, and aggressive people anxiously clinging to their property and inclined to look at the surrounding world with suspicion, always expecting an enemy to suddenly appear, intrude, and do harm. But still, that is our Christian vocation to convert hostis to hospice, the enemy into a guest, and to create the free and fearless space where brotherhood and sisterhood can be formed and fully experienced in community. That's the Christian vocation. And here now when it draws opposites, which are true opposites, the opposite of hospitality is hostility. The opposite of hospitality is hostility. And you might be thinking, well, no, I mean, if I don't open up my home to a homeless person, that doesn't mean I'm hostile to a homeless person. And, and you're right. You're, you're right. That may not be true because there's um, classes we still need to take on boundaries and on risk and on who is um, really the stranger to us who we're called to care for. We, we need to consider and, and talk about all of that. But in your heart, if hospitality is a heart posture, which is our, our premise going forward, that hospitality is a heart posture, the opposite of hospitality really is hostility. What is your heart toward that person? And if we redefine it as not doing harm versus doing harm, then we can more clearly see that the opposite of hospitality is hostility. Ask yourself that question, am I doing harm? And very often by doing nothing, we do harm, right? Think about the child on the playground who's being bullied or teased. Harm is coming to him. But who is being har hostile, rather? Who is being hostile to that person? Is it just the kids who are bullying him? Is it just the kids who are teasing him? Or is there hostility being demonstrated in that crowd of kids standing around watching and doing nothing? What does it take for evil to continue? Overt hostility or for good people to do nothing? When is harm being done? And if we ask those questions of ourselves, I think it becomes clear that the opposite of hospitality isn't just apathy, it's hostility, because to not extend a welcome extends harm. And I, I hear your butts, but, 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 what about this, what about that? I hear them all, and we're going to address them all. This is the introduction class. But start, let that mulling around in your head. Hostility versus hospitality. Um, and, and now one proposes there that all people are looking for community. So how do we do that? How do we begin to allow the Spirit to transform us from a heart posture of hostility to one of 
loving the stranger. And I offer some ideas on that next slide. I'm not going to go through all of them, but forgiveness is one. Forgiveness is, is key. If we are harboring resentment or animosity or lack of forgiveness toward a person or a people group, it's impossible to offer them genuine biblical hospitality. Now one says the stranger needs to be able to enter in and become a friend. Actually, this, this was Mrs. Law Wolf in his book, uh, Exclusion and Embrace. Excellent book. Um, where a person can be invited in to become a friend rather than an enemy. And that requires forgiveness. It's really prerequisite to genuine hospitality. Number two, hospitality is not offered to change someone, but to offer them space where God can change them, a space where change can take place. Hospitality is not to bring someone in to our world, to our life, to our home, to get them to believe our side, to get them to come around to our way of thinking, but rather to offer freedom not disturbed by dividing lines. That's Wolf also. Freedom, I'm sorry, uh, hospitality involves risk. Uh, there's a quote that says in hospitality, you will get used. Get over it. It's going to happen. It's going to be risky. And as we go through, you'll see in the biblical stories of hospitality, the great risk involved in each one of them. And risk is never an excuse. Yeah. Go back and think of Jesus and the Good Samaritan, right? The person is beat up. He's left on the side of the road, and, and the first individual walks by, and Jesus does not excuse that person and say, oh, they were just apathetic. They get a pass. Nor the second person who goes to the other side of the road and chooses not to help. It's still considered an act of harm. They did not stop to help. Would it have been risky for either one of them to have stopped to help? Yes, there would have been great risk in that, but that didn't let them off the hook. Rather, the third person, the good Samaritan, who stopped to help, there was great risk upon him. It violated all sorts of, of cultural faux pas, but that's the one who chose right. He chose to truly love the stranger. Hospitality involves risk, and we'll work through that as we go on. And uh, number five, welcome Christ, for Jesus already invited them. If you look at the table, this banquet table that Jesus offered, he already set out all the chairs to everybody. The people you don't like, the people group you think don't deserve it, the people who have hurt you, who have betrayed you, who have wounded you, the chair for them is already there at the table. So if you deny them hospitality, in essence, what you're doing is removing their chair from the table. It's an act of hostility. You're removing their place, the chair that Jesus already put to the table. Hospitality begins with a heart posture. There's some internal work that has to happen first so that our heart posture is in concert with our acts of hospitality that we do. So they run in tandem together. More action of, quote, hospitality than what our heart really feels? That's not true biblical hospitality any more than is a heart that loves but does nothing. They have to run in concert together. And um, it's more complicated than it sounds. And we're going to work through that as we go through these classes. Next slide, that's your takeaway for the week. Here, here's the big lesson that you should take with you. The capacity to bear burdens is the capacity to which one is the host versus the guest. Think about that. Are you bearing the burden of another person? Because that's what it means to truly love them, Jesus says, to, to lay your life down for them. It is love. Are you really loving them? Or are you loving yourself in some way through your hospitality? Because the capacity to bear a burden is the capacity to which one is the host versus the capacity to which one is the guest. Sometimes you think 
that you're the host, but when you go into the situation, you realize it's the guest you brought to the table who's stronger than you are. They're the one who's receiving your story and carrying it for you. They're the one of perseverance. They're the one of love. They are the one of mercy. They are the one of grace. They are the one of fortitude in the conversation, not you after all. And by the time the scenario is over, you realize I was really the guest and they were the host. And when that happens, we realize that we have been in the presence of God in another person. That we have been hosted by Christ. We thought we were the host. But our ability to truly bear the burden was subpar to the other as the Spirit of God lived through them. The capacity to bear burdens is the capacity to which one is the host versus the guest. And friend, it's okay to be the guest. In fact, that's the next lesson that you'll see live happening in a class is learning how to be the guest. And we'll go to the Garden of Eden where God is that great perfect host and we are invited to be the guest. We have to learn how to be the guest. We have to accept being the guest to receive true, perfect, beautiful hospitality from God before we can then exhume and exhibit biblical hospitality toward another person. Hospitality is a lifestyle. It's not just one act that you do separate and apart from your heart or way of life. Hospitality is a lifestyle that emerges from the Christ event. Jesus's life, Jesus's willingness to die, putting everyone before himself. Jesus' death and Jesus' great gift of life and his resurrection for others. From that mystery, from that beauty, from that perfect event comes our life, lifestyle of hospitality. So feel free to um, send me your questions, email them to me, uh, talk to me about your questions, and participate in the rest of this class on true biblical hospitality. I do want to show you some other works to read if you want to go forward. There's, uh, like I said, Christine Pohl, her seminal, legendary, life-changing, church-changing work, especially in making room, her work making room. I highly recommend. Nowen's work, Reaching Out. Um, and Philip Haley, he did a work called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed, the story of the village of Le Chambon and how goodness happened there, about this little village in the south of France during World War II that exhibited true biblical hospitality. Highly, highly recommend it to get an example of that. And lastly, Mislav Wolf's work, Exclusion and Embrace. It's much more scholarly, but... Um, seminal and profound and, and and wonderful. It's going to take you a while to get through it. You might want to go through it three or four times over a lifetime, but Exclusion and Embrace by Wolf, I highly recommend. So read those books and, and we'll look at other things as we go through. And I'm so glad you're on this journey of hospitality, of philoxenia, loving the stranger together.